So good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on. Good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful. It is so great to see all of you here. Uh, my name is James McShay, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Assistant Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Um, I want to say welcome, and I also want to say how excited I am uh, to share a few opening remarks for our wonderful speaker today, uh, Jalissa Trapp. Round of applause for Jalissa. <laughs> so in a few moments, um, our good colleague, Dr. Emma Rose, uh, will actually have the pleasure of introducing uh, Jalissa to us. Um, but before she comes up and does that introduction, um, I just wanted to share some remarks about the topic uh, that Jalisa will be covering for us. Um, her topic is entitled, Uncovering Hidden, Hidden Pathways, Anti-Racist Approaches for Engaging Non-Dominant Youth in STEM. Her topic is certainly a compelling one, and it's timely. And I would say that there's a real sense of urgency, um, not only kind of nationally in a national discourse um, around um, STEM and um, creating pipelines and pathways for students from underrepresented backgrounds going into um, STEM fields. But I would say here in our own region, in our own very campus, um, we've been having these conversations as well. Um, we've been wrestling with this question of how do we holistically develop our STEM students um, with the goal of enabling them uh, to bring their full selves um, to the college learning environment. And for those of you who are working in K-12, I'm certain that you having the same question conversations as well. How do you create um, these opportunities for students to feel as if they matter, um, that their experiences matter, and that the school systems, right, that they're in have a real stake in their success? The goal for us is looking at how we honor our students' diverse histories, their experiences, and their ways of knowing, and see all of what they bring to us as assets and strengths, and not as deficits. Because we all are striving to put them on this path to graduate and to become the next um, generation of citizen leaders who are well prepared to affect change in an increasingly interdependent global society. As Jalissa helps us to think about how to best engage in these critical conversations around how anti-racist methods in our teaching can help our students experience success, I also invite you to reflect upon some questions. Because um, I argue that we really can't do this work well without understanding our own positionality and be willing to do the really hard work of developing an authentic anti-racist identity. So these questions that I'd like for you to ponder um, during our time together today is the following. How do I see myself, my racial self, in relation to the things that I teach and I write about and I do in the community? How do my students see me as a racial being in relation to the things that I teach, I write about, and that I do in the community. What would it look like for me to dismantle white normativity and dominance in my classroom spaces or in the other spaces where I do my work? And what does authentic engagement in anti-racism work look like for me within the context of my teaching and my scholarship? And who do I foresee receiving the greatest material benefit from my labor if I choose not to authentically engage in this work? Finding the answers to these questions is where I believe we can receive the best guidance about how to engage with others in doing the, the difficult work that we hope will be transformative, liberatory, and promote inclusiveness. So, so with that said, I'd like to introduce my wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Emma Rose, uh, for her to come up. She's a professor in um, 
Culture, Arts, and Communication within the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Um, she's going to share just a few words uh, with us. Um, also introduce our speaker today for today. So thank you again. Welcome. We're so happy to have you on our campus today. And we're so happy to kind of engage in this really important and critical conversation this afternoon. Dr. McShay, I think those words and those questions leave us all with a lot to ponder and think about in terms of our responsibility. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Jalisa. Um, before that, there's a couple of thank yous that I want to give um, for the folks who made this event possible. So um, I think it's wonderful when you have an event and there's people who are like clamoring to get involved, who are so excited about the topic. They're like, yes, yes, I would also like to be there and support this event. So first, the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Um, there's two divisions, Culture, Arts, and Communication, and also um, Science and Math, so both of those divisions. In addition, the School of Education has been a big supporter of this event, um, as well as the Office of Research and the Center for Equity and Inclusion. So let's give a round of applause for our sponsors. A little bit more business. Uh, it's my duty to tell you where the bathrooms are. Um, so if you come out here to the right, the bathrooms are right over there. Please watch out for the running track. Make sure you're looking left and right so uh, everyone's safe. Um, and also the exits, obviously our exit is right here. And then there's an elevator over there, a set of stairs, and also over there. So those are that's sort of the business parts of things. So um, it is my honor to introduce Jalisa. Um, there's probably lots of people in this room who might already be familiar with Jalisa and her work. You might be familiar with her work at the MIT Media Lab, where she is a researcher currently. Um, you might be familiar with her, like I am, from uh, getting to know her in, in the University of Seattle, where she completed her um, Bachelor's of Science in Human-Centered Design and Engineering. You also might know her if you have ever spent any time at the Tacoma Computer Clubhouse. Um, so that's both uh, the, youth, uh, the youth in our community and also the many people who have supported that organization. You might know Jalisa because you have had her as a colleague in Tacoma Public Schools or maybe even a teacher where she uh, taught at SAMI and is also a founding faculty of IDEA, two of our innovative charter schools here in Tacoma. You might be familiar with Jalisa uh, with her work with the Tacoma Action Collective. So you might have been in a protest with her or helped hold our local government or uh, institutions here in Tacoma accountable for their actions. So she has many things. She is an educator, she is a scholar, she is an activist. And if you don't know her, you're going to have the pleasure of getting to know her right now. So please, welcome Jalisa. Before I get started, um, I would like to do some acknowledgments. Um, so first, I want to acknowledge the land that we're on, which is Puyallup land. Um, so without that, we wouldn't be here today. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the fact that I'm a student at MIT, which uh, was created by slave labor. So the idea of MIT came out of the slave economy. And without that, I wouldn't be a student at MIT. I would also like to acknowledge um, some of the elders in the room who made it possible for me to be here. Um, so if there's anybody in here who had anything with me to do growing up, so whether it's the clubhouse or church, can you stand real quick? I know there's some more coming, they're just late. <laughs> um, if there are any students in here that have ever taught, whether it was at Tacoma Public Schools or the Clubhouse, can you stand? I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, all of my colleagues from Tacoma Public Schools, can you stand? All of my colleagues 
my classmates from the University of Washington. Can you please stand, Kiana? <laughs> I think there only might be one, but anybody who went to the clubhouse with me, Simone. <laughs> Any of my cousins here? <laughs> um, anybody that I worked with at Peace Community Center? And then lastly, I would like for my niece to stand up. <laughs> so my niece Jalen is really special and she's inspired a lot of the work that I do. She doesn't know that she's in my slides, but she'll see. I hope she's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so actually before I get started, there's one other thing that I would like to acknowledge and actually I need to unlock the computer here. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, Kimberly Pinshaw's work gets kind of mixed up. People throw out the word intersectionality without actually knowing what it is. Um, is there anybody who would like to give us a definition? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? I'm a teacher still. <laughs> anybody want to take a, a guess? I'll call it in some <laughs> Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? I think of it as a, a, as a tool for analysis. Um, it's a framework. It helps us understand how the experiences of some, um, particularly from historically um, kind of segregated, subordinated backgrounds, um, their experiences get buried underneath the experiences of others. So it makes it very difficult for us to understand how specific individuals within particular communities have um, you know, a lived experience that led them to be marginalized in some way. So, intersectionality is the theory that systems of discrimination or disadvantage are interdependent. So, it mean, they're interdependent. So, what that means is that they overlap. They do not exist as separate systems. So, when we're talking about intersectionality, we're talking about interdependent systems working at the same time. Um, and that's something that's really important to understand when we're looking at um, anti-racist pedagogy, uh, when we're looking about when we're looking at equity in STEM. A lot of times, people don't go beyond what's just on the surface, and we're not looking at these different systems that are at play at the same time. When we talk about equity in STEM, we don't talk about poverty, we don't talk about affordable housing, we don't talk about economics. There's a lot of different systems. We don't talk about violence. And those, all those systems are working at the same time, and those all need to be acknowledged. So just to give you all some more context about um, the work that I'm doing. So the way that this came about, um, I was doing a research project for a class called Technology and Social Change. And I started doing a lot of interviews. And the words that are on the screen are words that came up a lot. Um, you hear people talking about the achievement gap, about poverty. Um, you hear them talking about health and underrepresented, education. So these were words that came up a lot. And I really like word clouds, so I put it in a word cloud um, to help me visualize it and to help me actually remember the words that people were saying, um, the topics that kept coming up. So for me, the problem was that the race, class, and social barriers to constructionism and education for non-dominant youth prevents their access to participation in career and higher education opportunities in STEM fields. So that is a mouthful. So I'm gonna break that down just a little bit. So first of all, constructionism. So at the MIT Media Lab, I am in the Lifelong Kindergarten Research Group. Um, that group was actually founded by Seymour Papert. Um, 
And what he advocates is for the learner-centered education through participation and project-based learning. So a lot of times we hear project-based learning and then all the projects look the same. <laughs> Everybody builds the same birdhouse and we did project-based learning. Um, but what Seymour Papert is talking about is the learner being able to be in control of their own education and learning through doing. So through the projects that they're creating, they are constructing their own knowledge. And so that's the type of project-based learning that I'm talking about. Um, Simone can tell you. That's the type of project-based learning that we grew up doing at the Computer Clubhouse. We got to come in and work on projects that we were interested in. And the more we worked on projects, the more that we learned. Um, and we weren't restricted in, here's step-by-step step how you do this, but here's a camera, here's some lights, and we got to create projects, and we got really good at it, we became experts. We didn't even realize we were becoming experts, but we were constructing all of this knowledge by being able to work hands-on on this project that we were interested in. So a lot of people ask me about this word, non-dominant. Um, sometimes people say marginalized, underrepresented, underserved. I use the word non-dominant because it addresses power structures. So when we talk about racism, we're talking about a power structure. When we're talking about underserved, we're talking about a power structure. Marginalized, a power structure. So when I use non-dominant, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and it sounds better to me than underserved, underprivileged, marginalized, non-dominant addresses exactly what it is, which is a power structure. And non-dominant youth are the kids that are on the end that don't have the power. So to keep building on constructionism, uh, Mitch Resnick, who is my advisor at the MIT Media Lab, came up with the four P's of creative learning and that is projects, passions, peer, and play. And so what he is saying in this theory is that when you're working on projects that you're passionate about, um, you'll work longer and harder on projects that you care about, that have meaning, that are relevant to you. And, okay, um, and then working on these projects with your peers, um, working on projects with your peers that you care about, you'll spend a lot more time on these projects in a playful manner. And play is usually the one that people are like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm like, play? <laughs> if you guys don't know this meme, I need you to catch up. <laughs> um, and especially for, um, historically for black youth, we're not allowed to play in school. You play in school, you get in trouble and it's well documented. You look at the achievement gap data. In the achievement gap, you'll see that there's a disparity in discipline amongst black youth. We are not allowed to have a playful spirit. We're called loud, we need to tone it down, even though we just may be really excited about what it is that we're working on. Uh, we might be really happy to see someone, but no, we're not allowed to play. Um, and even digging deeper into that, um, we're not that far removed from the Jim Crow era. We're not that far removed from segregated schools. My parents went to segregated schools, not in the South, in the Midwest. Um, Tacoma was segregated, was desegregated through open enrollment, but we're not that far removed from it. Um, and so we need to remember that. And while my group is great, I think there's a couple of blind spots. And so when we talk about the four P's of creative learning, we talk about tinkering. Who's able to do that? Who's allowed to do that freely and be the full selves? And it's usually not kids that look like me. So there's a report called Black Girls Matter, um, pushed out over police and underprotected. Um, Go ahead and take a picture of the slide. <laughs> um, so if you have not read this report, um, it'll give you a really good sense of what's going on now, especially with black girls. And I talk about black girls a lot because I am a black girl and because I know what it's like to be disciplined 
at higher rates than white counterparts in school for arbitrary reasons. And so just one highlight from this report, black girls are six times more likely to be suspended from school than white girls. And what that leads to is currently, black girls are the fastest rising population in the juvenile justice system. The highest. And that's something that's often ignored when we talk about the school and prison pipeline. And that's something personal. When I was a senior in high school, I had an emergency expulsion for gang activity. It's not on my record, and they often sent home black girls and just said, go take a break. My sister got sent home so many times, and it might not be on a record. Some of it is, some of it's not. But in that time, we weren't learning. But on the other hand, my sister and I were going to the clubhouse every day after school, learning technology. Um, I, in the midst of this emergency expulsion, I think I was applying for my second internship at Microsoft. So after my junior year of high school, I did my first internship at Microsoft, where I was the only one from Tacoma. I was one of two black girls, and all of the other students of color came from Technology Access Foundation. I woke up every morning at 4.30 to take a bus to downtown Tacoma, a bus from downtown Tacoma to downtown Seattle, then downtown Seattle to Redmond to be at work by 8. And then leave at 5 to do it all over again the next day. So I didn't have much of a summer because I had to wake up early. But that didn't matter because I was a black girl and emergency expulsion for gang activity when I wasn't even at school that day. They called home and because of my friends who also weren't in a gang. But that's the type of things that girls are up against, um, that a lot of our youth are up against. And then we don't even get to participate in STEM. So there are a lot of things that we need to take a step back and look at before we can even look at equity in STEM. Are we even allowed to be at school? So who's already doing the work? Um, so there's two organizations that I would like to highlight. So one is the Technology Access Foundation. Um, if you are not familiar with Trish and TAF, get familiar. So Technology Access Foundation was founded over 20 years ago now. And actually there's a really cool connection between the Technology Access Foundation and the Tacoma Clubhouse. So the, the coordinator of the Tacoma Clubhouse back in the 90s opened up a computer lab at the Yesler Community House um, and went to her friends at Microsoft and said, hey, do you guys want to come volunteer and help teach these kids how to code? And they were like, teach kids how to code? Like, who does that? <laughs> but they came anyways. And Trish came and volunteered, and she said, this is what we should be doing. Trish quit her job at Microsoft to start Technology Access Foundation. And it started off as an after-school program and a program to prepare youth of color to go into professional internships such as Microsoft, Safeco, Expedia. But then she realized that even the work that she was doing after school was not enough. And now it is a six through 12 school. So if you are not familiar with Trish and Technology Access Foundation, you should get familiar. Um, and Trish's work is specifically looking at youth of color um, and also looking at the community. So they do a lot of community-based projects. So they're not just working on projects just for the sake of making a birdhouse. They're actually going out into the community and working on projects that are relevant to those students. So the other organization is the Clubhouse Network. So currently there are more than 100 clubhouses in 19 different countries. Um, so the Clubhouse was actually founded through the MIT Media Lab in the research group that I'm in currently. Um, and the purpose of it was to give youth access to technology and opportunities in mentoring. 
Um, these clubhouses were strategically placed in underserved communities where you wouldn't have these opportunities otherwise. Um, and so the clubhouse in Tacoma opened in 2001 in partnership with the Evergreen State College and Allen AME Church and a lot of generous people in the community that wanted a place for youth of color, black youth on the hilltop to be able to go and learn about technology and learn what was possible. What's so novel about both of these approaches is that they don't just believe like, oh, you know, all kids have this opportunity. They actually give the tools to the youth and allow them to explore them. And so when I talk about constructionism and that type of project-based learning, what I'm talking about is a power shift and giving youth this power that they don't normally have. So thinking back to myself and when I was in high school, I hated high school because I didn't have the power to change anything. I literally had one teacher that I felt believed in me, and she's here right now. <laughs> Can you stand up real quick? <laughs> other than her other teachers I felt like they didn't trust me I was doing all kind of cool things at the clubhouse but these teachers they didn't care like this is literally the only teacher who knew that I even went to the clubhouse after school um, who helped me with an essay. I won second place in an essay competition and won my family a new computer and a scholarship for school. But my teachers didn't know that. That's what, they didn't see that. They saw me with the rest of my friends and from, from the beginning, like I, I have this label on me. But after school, I have this place where I can go and I can do all of these cool things. I can get scholarships and I can intern at Microsoft. So if it wasn't for the clubhouse, like there's no way I would be here right now. There's no way that I would be at MIT. There's no way that I would even have a career in STEM. When I was in the seventh grade, before I started going to the clubhouse, what I wanted to do when I grew up, here. <laughs> I didn't even want to go to the clubhouse, actually. My aunt came and got me and my sister and said, we're going to this place. Um, it was a couple weeks actually after my parents had officially separated and she didn't want us at home by herself after school. And I went and I was like, I don't want to be here. I'm not working on anything. But there was this box and it said The Sims. And I really wanted to play The Sims because I heard kids talk about it at school, but we didn't have The Sims at home. And they told me that in order to play a game, I had to work on a project. <laughs> So I was like, okay, I suppose. So there was this program called Boo, and you just take pictures and you like, you click on it, you distort the faces. And I was like, I got jokes on them. I'm not working on a project, I'm just playing. <laughs> Next thing you know, I know how to use Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm working on projects. Next thing you know, I create my first interactive CD-ROM. And that was super cool to me because in school, when we had computer time and we got to play with um, Arthur and then we would tell the stories and you click through it, I learned how to make that myself. And the project that I worked on um, was called What If There Were No Black People? So if any of you know my mom, you know she is all black everything. I didn't even know that The Wizard of Oz was a thing because I'd only seen the wigs. <laughs> and so I was really into black history and so this opportunity to work on a project where I get to highlight black inventors and create my own interactive CD-ROM, that was amazing and I wrote all the code by myself and I was in the eighth grade. Again, my teachers didn't see that, no. Um, they saw me in class with my friends. Um, I actually, when I got to high school, the only uh, advanced class that I was in was math, which I should have been in advanced classes. All of my classes should have been honors classes, but it wasn't, and nobody paid attention, nobody cared, and so I kind of didn't try. And actually, when I got chased down to be an AVID, which is a college prep class, I didn't even want to do it. I was like, who is this lady? Why does she want me to come to this class? But I'm glad that I did. <laughs> uh, because it, 
also opened up a lot of different opportunities for me. So how can we do the work? So I've kind of told you guys a few different ways, but I'll go back through it. Um, so when we look at anti-racist work, I think a lot of times when people hear anti-racist, they automatically assume like just, oh no, I'm not racist. And that's how I do the work. I just, me, myself, I just won't be racist and that's how I can do the work. But there's a lot of work that needs to put in, be put into it. So the first thing is, our learning spaces need to be equitable by design. So the first thing that I do, on the first day, I usually, I don't take attendance. I let students introduce themselves and tell me their names. How many of you have had somebody stumble over your name and it was embarrassing? It's really embarrassing. And you know, it gets to a point where you're just like, just give me a nickname. And names are really important. They're very important. Your parents gave you that name. And even if that's not the name you go by, the name that you chose is important to you. And it's important to students. And so you want to make sure that they have the opportunity to tell you their name. And the way that we usually start my class is you say your name and three things that you value. As you are listing off your values, I'm writing them down on the whiteboard or a piece of paper. I'm writing them down somewhere. It depends on how long we'll be in that space. If it's a short period of time, I'll write it on the whiteboard, and you'll notice that so there are words that are repeated. And I do that on purpose so that you can see that other people value the same things that you value. And after we do introductions, we talk about what it means to have values and to find people who value the same thing that you do. And so that you know that your values in this space is going to be respected, and that you have other people that you can go and talk to, even if you don't know them. I know that you value family, so I can come and talk to you about that. Because we're gonna be in that space together for a while, and we need this space to be comfortable. We need this to be a space where you feel free. So then we do community guidelines. And so I don't create the community guidelines, we do it as a community. So usually what happens if you know me, you know I always have sticky notes. Um, I pass out sticky notes. We write down how we want to be treated in this space. And what that means is not just be respectful. What does that mean? What does that look like to you? And there's always a few that I add if other students don't add it. The first one is we want to create a brave space. So a lot of times we hear people talking about, we're gonna create a safe space. And I let my students know that I can't always ensure that what somebody else says around you is gonna make you feel safe. But what I can do is provide a brave space where people around you feel brave enough to speak up if somebody says something that makes you feel unsafe, where you feel brave enough to say, hey, that wasn't cool, where, you, where everybody in the room feels brave enough to act the other thing that I usually add is assume positive intent. So if somebody does say something that makes you feel unsafe, we're going to assume that they have the best intentions until we know that they don't, so that we can create a dialogue. The other thing that I add is to trust people's experiences, even if it's not your own. And that piece is really critical, especially if you want to create an environment where you can talk about race. Because you can't do that if you have people saying, oh no, well I've never seen that happen. Or I've, then people shut down and they don't want to talk about their experiences. So you want to make sure that your classroom, that when people walk into your space, they know that there are values, they know that there are community guidelines, and they know that they're going to be held accountable for it. So before I even move on to teaching anything, everyone in the classroom, including myself, agrees to the community guidelines. And that's very, very important because we're all accountable now. And it's something that you can refer to throughout the rest of the time that you have together, whether it's just a workshop or a classroom. But making sure that people feel safe. And not just safe as, you know, 
not just safe as um, like a feeling like, oh, I feel safe, but safe enough where they feel that they can be brave and they feel that they are free and free enough to be able to talk about things that are hard. This is also really important because in this work, um, a lot of times when we talk about anti-racist pedagogy, we talk about um, centering stories around marginalized people, and you put them on the spot. And a lot of times we're not talking about how to tell other people how to be an ally, which is also equally important. Sorry, Lene, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, so, the, even the name uh, Uncovering the Hidden Pathways came from a class that Linnea and I taught last year. Huh? Uh, it's called um, Infiltrating Spaces, Uncovering Hidden Pathways into STEM. And one thing that we talked a lot about last year, and we're also teaching a class together this year, um, we talked about how to be an ally. So if you've been to IDEA, there are a lot of white boys. There are girls there, there are girls, my niece is gonna be there next year. Um, there are girls there, but there are also a lot of white boys. And so instead of putting the responsibility on the non-dominant youth, it's important that we also share these stories and we have discussions on how to be an ally. So we do things like read stories that have, writ that have been written. Um, there's Me Too and STEM that has a whole list of stories. Um, there's Vanguard STEM that has stories of women of color in STEM. Um, watching hidden figures and talking about what it was like then and what it's like now and talking about what it means to be an ally. None of those conversations can happen unless we have these community guidelines in place. Because without that, then it, it, it's easy to be dismissive. So working on relevant projects. So when I talked about the Computer Clubhouse and Technology Access Foundation, both programs really focus on working on projects that are relevant to you. A lot of times what happens is we say, we're gonna do culturally relevant projects. <laughs> True story, there's a computer science curriculum that is culturally relevant and some of the activities include uh, Native American weaving and algorithms for braids, which may not be relevant to all the students. And when you work on projects that are relevant to them, <coughs> youth will tell you what is relevant to them. And so I had to change that curriculum around a lot to make sure that my students were working on projects that were meaningful to them. So one example, um, an intro to programming, we're using Scratch. So Scratch was also created out of the MIT Media Lab in my research group, Lifelong Unigarden. <coughs> in the curriculum, it had some step-by-step, -step, do this, do that. You need to have at least 10 blocks in your program. And whether they have 10 blocks or not, there's other ways to demonstrate their knowledge. And so what we did instead because at the time, my students were really into YouTube how-to videos. They created their own how-to tutorials. These how-to tutorials needed to be accessible, and we had already gone over accessibility, so they knew that it meant people needed to be able to read it and to hear it. And students worked really hard on these projects, students that I saw really standoffish in the beginning, we're really excited to show what they know how to do. That was relevant to them. I saw students work on how to fold an origami crane. I didn't even know they knew how to do that, but that was very relevant to them. And that wasn't something that was forced. It was something that they were interested in. And they even brought in a bunch of models and showed students how to do it. Um, it also got students talking to each other. Oh, you know how to do that? Can you show me how to do that? Students that normally wouldn't talk to each other were staying in my classroom during lunch and having these discussions. And you're not gonna get that discussion if every student is working on the exact same project and their measurements have to be exact, precise, and you paint it. Oh, you put a flower on it and now it's personalized. <laughs> That's not it. 
and it's not relevant. At that same, actually, the project before that, they were working on websites, and they were also learning about the government. Um, and one student came to me and asked, I don't really care about the government. Can I make my website about shoes? And I said, sure. And he was like, sure, are you sure? <laughs> I'm sure. The next day, he came back and showed me his website that had so many features that we hadn't even covered in class. He was so excited to work on something that was relevant to him that he went home and he spent time at home. And as a computer science teacher, I don't give homework because I know that every student doesn't have access to a computer at home. So we work on projects that they can finish in class and they have access to come in before and after school. But it was important to him to keep learning web design. So he went home and kept working on it himself. And he was so excited to show me all the Jordans that he put on his <laughs> website. It was a really nice website. And when he got an exceeding on his project, he was really excited. And that motivated him to keep going. But that wouldn't have happened if I would have told him, no, you have to make this website with these steps. Representation and mentorship. So these pictures are actually from our class last year. On the first day, we asked students to draw a picture of a scientist or an engineer. None of the students drew a picture that looked like them. One student drew a picture of a woman did not look like her, still had a lab coat and beakers. Not one student drew a picture that looked like them. So our students are not even seeing themselves as scientists, as engineers, as people who can work in math. They don't see that. This is what they see. And so it's really important that we create this knowledge for them. So in my classroom, students walk in and they see posters up of different people who have careers in computer science that look completely different. Uh, people of color, women, you see a lot of different representation. You see different descriptions of the projects that they worked on, whether it was uh, about fitness or whether it was something about music but they saw a lot of different representations. And they noticed, I had kids come and ask me, where'd you get these posters? Or is this a real project? Can I look it up? Last year, we also took a trip to Microsoft. So none of the students that went to Microsoft had ever been there. And Microsoft's not that far. We had a panel of people who work at Microsoft who have a lot of different careers. And by the end, we had one girl come up to us and tell us, thank you. I never thought that I could work at Microsoft, but now I think that I can, and I want to apply for an internship. But before going there, she never saw herself as someone who could work at Microsoft, which is not that far from us. She didn't see it possible, but until that's brought to her, she doesn't see it. And sometimes people get tripped up over the fact, well, I don't know a woman of color in STEM. There's so many resources. Um, you can go online. So Vanguard STEM has a collection of stories of women of color in STEM. So Vanguard STEM is a project that you could go and look at. There's a podcast, there's blogs, so they can read it, or they can listen to the stories. Go to universities, ask students to come in. College students like to volunteer, especially if it's something that they can just come in, do really quickly. But seeing that representation, it matters. It really makes a difference. If there was not a black woman named Laversa Sullivan who taught me how to code, there's no way that I would have thought that it was something possible for me. So you actually have to do the work you need to make sure that it's visible to those students. Because if you don't, they're not going to see it. It's not something that they're just going to go actively looking for. You need to be vigilant and be working towards that. I'll 
this was just me and a couple students <laughs> at Microsoft. So this was our, uh, our trip to Microsoft. Um, they were so excited about this Microsoft trip that they made a video blog the whole time. <laughs> Starting on the bus ride. We're on the bus! Uh, so they, we also took a picture for their video blog. Um, but this meant a lot to them. Um, and what's really funny is the two girls standing next to me, when they were taking my computer science class, I called them my little struggle books because they would complain, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then they would get something and they would scream and be so excited that they figured out some code. Um, this past year, I've been away and I got an email from one of them who told me that she was struggling over her final project for computer science and then she remembered what I told her. And she relaxed and she finished it and she turned it in. And she felt very nostalgic, so she wanted to email me and tell me thank you. So we also want to make sure that we're making these connections. I worked with a group of students in Boston and when I asked how many of them know anybody in their family, and their family can include family friends. How many of them know anybody who has a career in STEM? One kid said that they know an MIT grad student slash teacher. They had just met me five minutes before. <laughs> other than that, every other kid answered that they knew nobody who had a career in STEM. So if you don't know anybody in your social network who has a career in STEM, how are you supposed to learn these things? My parents didn't have a career in STEM, and it's not enough just to do these activities in school and work on these projects and then say, go into the world, now you can be an engineer. Because when I got to college, I struggled. When I got to the University of Washington, I took my first computer science class, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Which was crazy because I had worked on so many projects, starting from when I was in the eighth grade. I knew how to code. When I got to the University of Washington, I felt like I couldn't. I, was, I didn't feel prepared. But lucky, luckily for me, I still had a network in Tacoma that I can go and talk to and say, hey, I, you know, I don't know what's going on with me. I can't do this. And they would tell me, yes, you can. Simone would come visit me at UW when she was still in high school. Uh, my sister, you know, they would come and visit. But also just being able to go back to the clubhouse and remind myself, you can do this, even if you are in a different environment. It was really hard, but if students don't have that, how will they know? So. What this is, um, last year, on the first day of school, we asked students to write down careers in STEM that they know of. Everything in green is what they said. If you ask them to describe those jobs, they couldn't tell you. You know, what's a math teacher, not math teacher, what's an accountant do? They didn't know. Um, computer programmer. What does a computer programmer do? They didn't know. And so as the class went on, as we had guest speakers, as we did different activities, they kept adding. So this was probably a week and a half into the class. Um, so you see UX researcher and UX designer, that's thanks to Emma. Um, but as we had people come in and talk with them about what they do and exchange contact information with them, they started to make these connections. But these are not connections that they're going to make on their own just because you did a project and it had all these connections to electrical engineering. Unless you tell them that, they're not going to know. So you need to make these connections and you need to be specific because without that, like, how will they know? Like, my, my mom had no idea what I was doing at the clubhouse. She had none. She knew that I was doing stuff that was important, but she couldn't tell me, oh, well, Julissa, you can go and be a UX researcher. You should do usability studies. She had no idea what any of that meant. 
So it was important that I had someone to help make those connections. Um, and even digging a little deeper into that, um, when we talk about making those connections, we want to be, we want to make sure that we give them a wide range of possibilities. So for example, we talk about girls who like to do hair. Usually people jump to geometry. I don't want to do stuff with geometry, but I do like stuff with design. And so UX was a really good fit for me because I still got to do coding, I got to design, I got to talk to people. But that's not a connection that other people would have made. They would have just told me geometry and I would have just been like, no, I don't like geometry. <laughs> But really making sure that you let them know everything that is possible and not assuming that they're just going to pick it up just because they worked on this project. So that does require more work on your end because we are at this disadvantage where we're not in a social network where we know people. Luckily today, my niece knows because I'm her aunt. So she can come and ask me. But actually, sorry girls, let's talk about you. <laughs> so, I think this was 2014. Uh, we had a summer program at the Computer Clubhouse. Um, so my niece and a group of girls, so the, the theme of that summer was nutrition. So they learned all about <coughs> nutrition, about making healthy food choices. So what Jalen and her group decided to create was a game to teach kids how to make healthy food choices in school. They brought in actual food and let people touch the food and it was connected to um, the screen. And so if you touch the food, then on the screen it would show you the different calories, nutritional value. And they worked on this themselves. Jalen's only in the eighth grade right now. This was some years ago. Um, last year, I came home in November in the car with Jalen, and I was asking her what she wanted to do when she grew up. She told me that she kind of wants to be a game designer, but that means that she would have to code, and she doesn't think that she's that good at code. And I was like, yes you are, you taught all the other kids how to do scratch. And she's like, oh, that was code. We need to make sure that we are making those connections and being specific. Jalen now wants to be aerospace engineer. Aerospace engineer. <laughs> it might change again. It's okay. She knows that she has a lot of different possibilities. Um, but before that, even though she was working on these projects and it was really cool and fun, she still needed that connection to be made. We need to make sure that we are being specific in STEM. Because without that, like, we're gonna do all this, they're gonna do all this great work, and then do what? So we need to make sure that we make those connections. So that's me when I was 16, 17? I think 16, uh, with Miss LaVersa. Um, so for me, none of this would have been possible without a mentor like Miss LaVersa, who was a black woman, who taught me how to code, <coughs> who taught me to be unapologetic about who I am, um, who told me, yes, you can do that. Um, oh, you don't want to do it? Try it anyways, and then we'll see if you don't want to do it, and then that'll be fine. But without her guidance, there's no way that I would have been able to do anything. And this is actually, so I, I was 16 in this picture, so this was before I interned at Microsoft. We would go to Microsoft every year, and this year I just so happened to enter an essay writing contest, and I got second place, and it was a brand new desktop computer, and a scholarship. So I got a scholarship, and I wasn't even a senior in high school, and actually this was my second scholarship. The first one that I got was through um, Mesa, and we had done a summer program with Mesa, and so I got the Boeing Synth Scholarship when I was in the 10th grade. Um, my mom had no idea how to help me get scholarships or anything like that. But because I was involved in this program, because I was in a space where I felt free, where I could work on projects that I was passionate on with my peers and in this playful manner where I could bring my full self, I was able to translate that into college scholarships, into going to college, 
into coming back to my community, into going to MIT. So I always like to end with something positive and usually this picture. Um, so January 2017, I think they're both here now. Jamika, Kana, and Chris, are you guys here? Can you guys stand up? Because you guys weren't here earlier when I acknowledged you. <laughs> oh. Jamika's here somewhere. Um, so Jamika, Kana, and Chris, I organized with, with Tacoma Action Collective. Um, and so part of what has allowed me to do so many of these things is through activism. So one day, Jamika, Kana, and I were like, let's take some girls to see hidden figures. We had our own money, and we're just like, all right, we can take five high school girls, five college girls. We put it on Facebook, and all of a sudden, we had people donating money, and we took more than 50 people to see hidden figures, which was really important. And that took the whole community. That didn't just take you know, me going and saying, hey, can we do this? I just said, we're doing this, and the community showed up. And so that's what needs to happen in our education. We don't always have to wait for people to come and tell us, oh, now this is what we're gonna do. Sometimes you just have to put out that call and do it. Because if we didn't, we would have just been sitting at the movie theater by ourselves. <laughs> 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 um, Um, so we've got some time for a question and answer, so we're going to ask folks to speak into the mic so everybody can hear. So if you've got a question, or a story about Jalisa, oh. I think. <laughs> <laughs> or about your, about your own journey or path in this stuff. Yes, about your own journey. <laughs> we're going to have to call on people. Oh, no, I think this means classes. Chris, you had a question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, as someone that kind of runs a community program, and I know um, a lot of the courage that I take. Tell them what your program is. Um, so I run a community center called Vabitat um, that was on MLK. Now we moved to 11th and L, and we do art and design and stuff like that. Um, but I'm just, first of all, super inspired by your work. Um, your activism inspired me to like believe that I could step out into the community, speak up about issues that matter, and it's not, and um, and to be more courageous about that. Yeah, and it's hard to do that as a leader when you know that there's a program that is also connected to your own personal, ex um, you know, reputation, so on and so forth. Um, but I wanted to ask about, you know, um, I think for a lot of, for a lot of uh, people of color who are interested in radical shifts in education, um, oftentimes the school system is held up as this like holy grail of if we can just get in and infiltrate and change the way that they do things, then we can make a systemic, large systemic change. And um, and then I got in and I was like, oh, <laughs> there's some problems and there's some, you know, there's advantages, but there's also barriers. And I guess I'm, I'm interested in your expertise and experience as someone that has worked within both within the school, the public school system, as well as doing things independently and doing those simultaneously. What do you think are the unique advantages that that where it's important to push boundaries within the school system? And what do you think are places where actually um, are, you prefer to do out in the community? Like, can you talk about the necessity of those other educational spaces as well? So I was really fortunate enough to be approached to come and work at the Science and Math Institute um, and to help start um, the Industrial Design Engineering Art School, IDEA and SAMI. Um, and I was also very fortunate to work with admins who allowed me to do my thing. Um, so Zach is here, I think. So Zach uh, would often walk into my classroom at Idea, and kids would be all over the place making Play-Doh in a computer science class. <laughs> uh, 
doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and he would just, well, this is Julissa's classroom, um, where I know that that's not the case other places. Um, other places, you're being evaluated as teachers. You have standards, you have grades. Um, so it does take a lot of courage. I think just because of my activism, I'm just like, oh, we're just gonna step up, we're just gonna do it. But I know that's not the case for everybody. Um, some of the things that I've tried to do is I've tried to blend that. So a few years ago, we organized an MLK event where in the morning we had an MLK assembly that we normally have. And in the afternoon, we had 50, more than 50 black leaders from the community come into the school and read letters from a Birmingham jail with students. Um, and that's something that hadn't happened before. But that's something that I'm used to doing is calling on my community and saying, hey, I need your help to come and do this. Um, and so for me, it's been a, an experiment trying to get both. Um, so then I've also had students from the school come to the clubhouse to work on projects that maybe they didn't have time to work on in their classes. Um, so it's hard for me there's like this blurred line where i'm trying to do both i think what we really need is a lot more people in the community and the schools um, so many times it's been separate and that school even growing up my parents did not come to school unless i was getting an award or getting in trouble <laughs> and that's a problem um, but that's also the way that they were raised and so I don't blame them for that, but we need a lot more people from the community coming to volunteer in classrooms. Um, anytime I've asked Emma to come into the classroom and talk about her work, she's there or we go and visit here at UW Tacoma. Um, there's just so many different ways to engage the community. So for me, I feel like there's a blurred line that we can crisscross over. Um, so it sounds like when you were at UW, you ran into troubles and um, found supports um, outside of school in your community. I'm wondering what you would have liked to have had in the way of support at UW or what was there that was useful to you. So what was really useful for me, I'm going to call on Zilfer because she just walked in here. I don't know where she went. Zilfer, where are you? Where'd she go? Oh, there's Zilfer. <laughs> Kiana, can you stand up? Kiana, stand up. <laughs> so Kiana and Zilfer are my friends from college. <laughs> and so what was really helpful for me, you can stand up, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what was very helpful for me was having community. So Zilfer, Kiana, along with a lot of other people, um, even though we were pursuing different things, we would check in each other. Are you okay, sis? Is everything okay? Um, what I learned later that I wish I would have known before is I needed to use my resources. So when I was in high school, I was taught that going to tutoring meant that there was something wrong with you. And so then when I got to college and I tried to go to tutoring, so there's this thing called Clue, where it's like this late night tutor, and you go at 9 p.m. to like midnight. I went, and all the kids in there were smart, and it was like they don't even need tutoring, so I didn't feel comfortable in there because they knew everything. I wish that I would have known how to use those resources. So when we talk about making connections, that's also something that we do in the classroom. So Lamea knows. In the classroom, I have an ask three before me rule. You need to use your resources. You need to learn how to be comfortable in using your resources. And so that three doesn't necessarily mean ask three different students, but you should ask your peers. We have these wonderful things called smartphones that have Google. <laughs> learn how to do a search. Learn how to be comfortable asking for help. And then if you absolutely cannot do it, then I will help you. I don't want you to struggle, but I want you to learn how to be comfortable with asking for help. And that's something that I absolutely was not comfortable doing at UW. And I was suffering, and I felt like I was struggling all on my own. Until I started talking to my friends, and they were struggling too. And so um, really having that support was helpful, but 
had I known about all of these resources and that it was okay to ask for help, it would have made things a lot different for me. Okay, I'll just project. Okay. Um, so following up on that, so what happened in the classroom to make you think all of a sudden that you couldn't do the things that you've been doing before you got to UW? So when I got to UW and I sat in the computer science class, it was a big lecture hall, like 300 students. There was this white guy at the podium like this who was typing on his computer and it's showing up on the screen and everybody's taking notes. And I'm just like, that's not how I learned how to code. I learned how to just work on a project <laughs> and we figure things out together. We see what works, we run it. Um, and then we started taking tests. Our tests were all on paper for a computer science class. And, I, and other kids in the class, they got it. They took AP computer science. My high school did not offer AP computer science. I think the only computer class that I took at the school was keyboarding, so I learned how to type without looking. I can still do it. <laughs> but I did not have that advantage. There were so many kids in that class who went to school in Bellevue, um, who went to private schools. It was a weeder course. So when you get to University of Washington, CSE 142, CSE 143 are weeder courses. They're meant to weed out people. And I was one of those people, even though I knew how to code. One thing that's really great now is um, AP Computer Science is being offered in a lot more high schools. So if you have students, encourage them to take it. Um, also with some of those uh, AP computer science courses is a college and the high school. So college and the high school is really great. It does cost money. Um, there is a reduced price for students who have free or reduced lunch. But they can take that class in their high school setting and get college credit for it. And so they can bypass those weeder courses where they're sitting, staring at a screen, watching this dude code, and then somehow you're supposed to remember it and compile your code on paper. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Um, I actually work with uh, like mostly Asian immigrant students and also some like East African immigrant <coughs> students in after school program. Uh, and I was wondering, I really resonate what you said about like thought you were just going to do hair. What I hear from a lot of them is like the same three things. And it's basically like what their parents want them to do. It's like a lot of nursing and medical stuff. Um, I'm wondering what your response is to like to that kind of stuff where they say the same same careers and how you try and like broaden their minds I guess. So what I do is I try to figure out what it is that they're interested in. So a lot of times people who want to go into nursing are interested in helping people. And there's a lot of other ways to help people. Um, really figure out what it is that they're interested in. Um, in the class that we taught last year, our front whiteboard was covered in sticky notes of everything our students were interested in. Like anything that they were interested in, we told them to write it down on a sticky note. And then we started connecting those interests to STEM careers and then issues in the community that they wanted to see solved. And so really looking at what they're interested in instead of just, oh, nursing. Oh, but you're interested in helping people. Here are different ways in STEM that you can help people. There's robotics, there's AI, there's UX. There's so many different things that you can do, but really looking at their interests instead of just this career that they've been told. Thank you very much. Um, I really love the idea of creative um, learning. I think I was a chemistry instructor here at University of Tacoma, and I think one of the, the things I run into, that discouragement, 
is I have this long list of chemistry topics mm -hmm. that they have to have mastered by the end of the year of chemistry. And it's not just that I, you know, they won't learn that, they need that for the next class and the next class. So I think the discouragement I have is like, how are we gonna get all through all of this and have it be creative and have this openness? I think it's just that fear of not getting through it. That wasn't a question. I guess I was asking a comment. <laughs> no, but that's, that's a real thing and that's something that you hear a lot. So in my group, we always advocate for creative learning. Um, and one thing that I'm always pushing back on is there's a lot of people that are creating these learning, creative learning guides and activities who never taught in the classroom, who are not held to these standards, who are not being observed, who don't have to have students take standardized tests. And so what that takes is a lot of collaboration and it takes extra work on your part. So I was very lucky enough to be able to work at a school where I can collaborate with the physics teacher and with the humanities teacher and we can come up with a project together where students are learning these different standards and we're able to grade them on these standards and we're able to see that they mastered them while they're still working on projects that they're interested in. But it does take a lot of work on your end and it does take you collaborating with people um, whether it's people within your building or bringing in people from the community. Hi, Jalisa. Um, Hi, Sophie. Hi. <laughs> um, you're such an inspiration, and um, I'm so lucky to have done some undergrad research with you and Dr. Rose, and um, as a <coughs> person whose parents are uh, refugees, it was really hard for me to figure out where I fit in my STEM identity, and computer science and I really looked to you and you kind of motivated me. Even though I was helping you help the girls code, Jalisa was always like, uh, you can do it. You know how to code as well. So I just want to appreciate you for just like supporting everyone around you. And um, now that I somehow graduated with my computer science degree, I feel like- you always somehow. <laughs> like you to help other people of color, um, other women, uh, people who are kind of in this intersection of like poverty and like access issue and how to get them to the point where they feel like they could enter the workforce. Um, what do you see that needs to happen in the workforce for it to also be an inclusive environment? Because say everyone here takes what you say and do amazing things um, in their classrooms and we graduate these amazing people of color, where do they go next if the workforce isn't um, conducive to their success? So that's a really good question. Um, so first, I hate diversity and inclusion. <laughs> and I really hate them because the way that they're talked about is inclusion, it's like you thought about me after the fact. Now you're trying to include me. And usually when people talk about diversity, now I'm a number, I'm a statistic. And you're just trying to see how many of <coughs> numbers you can fit into your company to write on this report to say, oh, we have four black girls here, yay. That's an increase from zero. <laughs> so what needs to happen is that as we're teaching these non-dominant youth how to be leaders and stand up, they know that, they're, that they can be unapologetic and they know that they know what they know and they go in and not be afraid. Because that change isn't gonna come about just because you know, we're like, oh, we're here, excuse me. Um, we need to go in and actually tell people what we need and what we want. And a lot of times um, we're timid about that because we don't know what we can ask for. Um, we don't know what's possible. Um, and what has allowed me to be more comfortable in that um, is both my activism and then the friends that I'm around. So I'm gonna call on Kiana again. Sorry, girl, I keep picking on you. Um, but Kiana is someone who is very unapologetic, um, who fearlessly goes and tells young someone, you, your education is important, and that's something that you deserve, and you have the right to this education, go get it. And you can tell the difference between students that she's worked with 
and students that she hasn't worked with because her kids walk in confident, we got this, we know how to do this, we know that we should be here. So in addition to everything else I said, you need to be building up their confidence. Because if it wasn't for somebody building up my confidence, I actually would have stopped going to UW. I was very discouraged. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on. I was coming back to Tacoma every day because my mom was really sick. Um, I started working two jobs because my mom couldn't work anymore and I was paying for stuff. And I was really discouraged, but when I came to Tacoma, or when my friends came up to Seattle, they were like, oh no girl, you got this. And I was like, oh you're right, I do got this. I forgot who I was for a second. <laughs> but if I didn't have that, and there's so many people that I know that started at UW who wanted to go into engineering, who dropped out. They dropped out, and UW was really hard because once you get into the school, you have to apply to your major. And if you're going into engineering, it's very, very competitive. And so it's like, oh, now I'm applying and I'm competing with these people all over again. But if I didn't have that confidence, if I didn't know, oh, there are people who came before me. Um, Ms. LaVersa was very adamant about making those connections and about representation. So we knew who Mae Jemison was. We knew about the history at NASA. We knew about black women who came before us. And so we didn't feel like, oh, we're the first ones or the only ones. We knew that we were standing on the shoulders of giants. And because of that, we could keep going. And so that's why representation is so important and that you do tell these stories and that you were purposeful in telling these stories so that kids don't feel like they're the only ones and like they can't do that. So then when they get to that workforce, they're just like, oh, no, 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 this is what we deserve, and this is what's going to happen, or you're not going to have any talent here. <laughs> um, so my question that I have for you, sorry, I'm over here. Oh. <laughs> I just, if it's okay, I'm going to sit. Um, so I'm an 11-year undergrad. I've dropped out um, by force from my department at the UW. Sorry, this is really hard to ask. I'm just trying to understand when you're talking about this confidence with other students, when you're talking to like quote unquote what I get dubbed as non-traditional or like I've spent a decade of my life working all these other jobs that are unrelated to my natural sciences degree and things like that, that I'm even when I, it's almost kind of like the discouragement that's like, even though I'm going to get this degree, like I'm that close and I'm back in, and it took a lot of advocacy for myself and that network that you were talking about and fighting for it, that it's just like, once you get it, it's like you're still behind. Because it's like in the natural sciences, they're like, oh, but you don't have a master's or a PhD and we're hiring postdocs for these non-unpaid internships in conservation. <laughs> um, so it's just kind of like, for me, it's like, I know tech, I feel like is very similar and those specialized skills that you have to learn and I'm just like wondering like a lot of the opportunities that I see for undergrads often cater to like this under 24 25 and you're starting to see a little bit more of those that are like increasing in age but it's like as someone that's going to be in their 30s you know it's like you don't really get those kind of there's like this gap there and I just am curious about like how you've been addressing that with students that are from like these non-dominant groups so I'm 30, I don't ever tell people my age. <laughs> um, so, starting a master's at MIT is really difficult because there are so many people who came straight from undergrad. And there's a big age gap. And there's some people who are career students. So they've gone just continuously. Um, actually, so when I graduated from the University of Washington, Instead of going to work for Amazon or Boeing or Microsoft, I did a miracle. Um, and I went to Peace Community Center. And people were just like, oh no, like why would you do that? Why wouldn't you go straight into tech? Do you know how much money you can make? But it was very important for me to go back to my community and do work that they saw as unrelated. But those skills that I got at Peace Community Center is why I'm able to teach. Um, I joke a lot and I tell people that I tweeted my way into MIT. <laughs> 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 I 
Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, yeah, I'm on this list of 200 black women in STEM to follow on Twitter. I feel like I tweeted my way into MIT because I documented the work that I was doing. Um, it was very important for me to tweet about it, to write a blog about it, to make a Facebook post about it, uh, because people needed to see that there is no blueprint. There are so many different ways to get into STEM. There's so many different opportunities. And then people aren't kind of like, here, come, go in and make that one. Because MIT, like, statistically thinking about it, there's no way that I should be at MIT. <laughs> like, absolutely no way. Even with my undergrad degree, I did not go and work in tech. I didn't do all of these different things. Even now at MIT, everybody's like, publish, 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 publish. I'm not publishing, um, but I'm still doing a lot of great work, and people will recognize that great work. They'll recognize your work ethic. And also, I need, if you don't know Sophie already, you should connect with Sophie. <laughs> about making sure that in your classroom uh, there's representation. When everybody sees that, oh, there are women of color who can code and who do this and who do that, um, that's something that they know is a fact. Because normally in their social networks, they also don't see black women as computer scientists or chemists or anything like that. So one, making sure that's visible to everybody, not just the black students because that's how you start to create allies, because then in their mind, if they hear somebody say like, oh, women can't do that. Oh yeah, there is, there's this poster that I saw in my teacher's classroom of this woman doing this, but making sure that they know. But then also being very strategic and very purposeful about addressing it. Um, so again, with the community guidelines, when we talk about trusting people's experiences, even though it's not your own, that's something that we take very seriously in my classroom, so that when we are reading these stories, there's so many stories out there that people have been collecting about women of color and people of color in STEM that they can read, and then they're not going to refute that and say, oh, that can't be possible because that never happened to me. But then we ask them to write a reflection. If this was a student here at school, how would you support them? So making sure that you have those conversations and you're asking them. And if they say, I don't know, then walking through it with them. And how would you want someone to help you if that was you? OK, we have time for one more. Good evening, Julissa. My name is Aki. And you played a critical role last summer in helping support Kiana and I's summer STEM program at Pierce College. So for that, I want to say thank you. Um, one of the questions that I have has been, when supporting non-dominant students who are entering higher ed at varying degrees of preparation, right? Some may have gone into the workforce and then uh, found their way into education at the community college level, or maybe come straight from high school. Is there a blueprint that exists for creating community-based projects that engage students who may be looking at STEM or could consider STEM and expose themselves to it. Um, I guess just from that, it doesn't exist? Or could we design it? So that's my thesis project, if you would like to help. <laughs> no, it actually is my thesis project. Um, so I am working on resources. So my thesis project is a creative learning guide. Uh, for engaging non-dominant youth in STEM. So there are a lot of facilitator tips that I talk about things that I've just talked about, but then how to do these activities and then also how to use resources. 
Um, eventually what I want to create is an online space both for students and families because a lot of times um, students may know what's going on but then their families don't and it's really hard to communicate that. Um, so there's been a, a few different things that I've done like family creative learning where uh, families come and learn how to code with their students at the clubhouse. Um, but there's still a lot more work to be done so that parents are also prepared because my parents had no idea what I was doing or how to support me, but girl, we'll pray for you, but that's it. <laughs> um, but that is something that I'm working on. And also, I don't want to be the only person working on it because I'm not the only person who has these experiences. And so for me, what's really important in the work that I do is that I co-design it with community. So I've been working with a lot of youth. I've been interviewing a lot of people. Um, when I create things, I take it to the community and bring it back and refine it based on what they say. And I also want to make sure that it's something that people can take and adapt for their context. So if you're interested, I'll give you my contact number, my emails up there. Um, but that is something that I'm working on as my thesis project. It's incredible to hear all of the different lives that Jalisa's already touched at this point in her life. Like, it's so lovely to hear all of your stories. Um, and it was just so gracious and wonderful to have you here. And we hope that we know you got ties here, so you're going to come back and visit us again, right? Okay, so a uh, final round of applause for Jalisa. Community, right? So uh, we have the room until six. If you want to stay, hang out, meet somebody new, come chat with Jalisa, please, uh, please do so. <laughs>